the International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia is now in session. La Diancio Tribunal Penal International por Lex Yugoslavia et Tuvert. Please be seated. The trial chamber is sitting today to, de to deliver its judgment in the case the prosecutor versus Vujadim Popovic, Ljubiša Beara, Dragon Nikolic, Ljubomir Borovčanin, Radivoje Miletic, Milan Gvero and Vinko Pandurovic. Will the accused uh, Vujadin Popovic please rise? The trial chamber finds you, Vujadin Popovic, to be guilty pursuant to Article 71 of the statute of the following counts. Count 1, genocide. Count 3, extermination as a crime against humanity. A judgment, whether a conviction or an acquittal, is the culmination of criminal proceedings before any criminal court, national or international. The path taken to arrive at the judgment, the conduct of the criminal proceedings themselves, can and does differ. In democracies around the world, the same main principles apply. A person is innocent until proven guilty. It's the duty of the prosecution to prove guilt in court. The rights of the accused are fully safeguarded. But the proceedings themselves, the dynamics of a trial, can differ significantly from country to country. This is why, at the international level, proceedings can't mirror those before any one national system. Who's to say that one is superior to another? Instead, the drafters of the rules of procedure and evidence at all international courts and tribunals sought to incorporate and benefit from the experience and provisions of the different legal systems. International criminal proceedings have also evolved in the 20 years since the creation of the first modern international tribunal, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Subsequent years have seen a proliferation of international judicial institutions, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, all ad hoc institutions with jurisdiction over individual countries. In 2002, the international community established a permanent international criminal court whose statute has been ratified by 122 countries so far. The Special Tribunal for Lebanon, established in 2007, is the latest of a growing family. The jurisdiction and work of all these courts and tribunals is regulated by their statutes, while the rules of procedure and evidence determine the conduct of judicial proceedings. Let's now take a look at how these proceedings unfold. Like in any national system, Following the commission of a crime which falls under the jurisdiction of an international court or tribunal, there will be an investigation. There's no international police force, so the international and hybrid courts rely primarily on their own resources and the cooperation of national authorities if possible. This is why the office of the prosecutor in each of the international courts employs experienced police officers and investigators, alongside lawyers or investigative judges. Investigations at the international level can be quite long and complex, involving interviews with many persons, victims, witnesses, experts, the collection of vast amounts of documentary evidence, forensic examinations of crime sites and mass graves. In most international tribunals, once the investigation and collection of evidence reaches a critical threshold, the prosecution lawyers will file an indictment. At the Cambodia Tribunal, this task is performed by co-investigative judges. When the indictment is filed by the prosecution, it must be reviewed and tested by the tribunal's judges. In some jurisdictions, like the Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, one of the trial judges is designated to check and confirm the charges. At the Permanent International Criminal Court, a pre-trial chamber is convened to perform this task. At the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, this job is entrusted to a specially appointed pre-trial judge. He will study the material submitted by the prosecutor and decide whether or not to confirm some or all of the charges. Once an indictment is confirmed, the appearance of the person or persons named is sought before the court. In some international jurisdictions, 
an arrest warrant is issued immediately. In others, an opportunity is first given to the accused to appear voluntarily. The Special Tribunal for Lebanon is the only international jurisdiction which does not necessarily require the appearance of the accused in order to conduct proceedings. Trials held in the absence of the accused are called trials in absentia. If an accused is arrested or voluntarily surrenders, a formal reading of the charges will take place in a hearing referred to as an initial appearance. This proceeding hails from the common law tradition and has a crucial impact on the continuation or not of the proceedings. If an accused pleads guilty to any or all of the charges and the judges are satisfied that certain criteria have been fulfilled, there will be no trial in respect of those charges. If the accused pleads not guilty or refuses to enter a plea, a full trial will be held. Following the initial appearance or at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, a decision to hold a trial in absentia, the pre-trial phase begins. The accused is entitled to have a lawyer from the moment of his initial appearance. If he's not present, the defence counsel will be appointed immediately following the decision to proceed in absentia. At almost all the international courts and tribunals, an office within the tribunal's registry is in charge of assisting defence counsel in the conduct of their duties. At the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, for the first time in an international jurisdiction, a defence office has been established as a separate organ of the tribunal to assist defence counsel. While the defence office does not represent the individual accused, it ensures the protection of their rights and to make the exercise of these rights effective. During the pre-trial phase, the prosecution and the defence prepare for trial. At all the courts and tribunals, this phase now occurs under the watchful eye of the judges. At the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, for example, the pre-trial judge is in charge of compiling a comprehensive file which contains all the relevant information about the charges and what the two parties, the prosecution and the defence, intend to argue. This file is transferred to the trial chamber before the beginning of trial. Once the judges determine that the parties have had sufficient time to prepare, they will schedule a trial. The trial is usually conducted before a trial chamber consisting of three judges. In some international courts, additional, alternate or reserved judges may also sit on the bench. At the beginning of trial, each party, the prosecution and the defence, as well as the legal representatives of the victims participating in the proceedings, may make opening statements. The defence can postpone such a statement until the closing of the prosecution case and the opening of the defence case. It's worth noting that the participation of victims in proceedings before international courts has evolved in the last two decades. While the early tribunals for the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda and Sierra Leone did not provide for victim representation, the International Criminal Court, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia and the Special Tribunal for Lebanon do so. At the Special Tribunal, there's a Victims Participation Unit which assists in this matter. In his opening statement, the prosecutor will summarise the charges and briefly explain what he intends to prove in court. Following this, the prosecution will begin presenting its evidence. The presentation of prosecution evidence will be followed by evidence called by the trial chamber at the request of victims participating in the proceedings, as well as evidence for the defence. In each case, the presentation of evidence will include testimony of witnesses and introduction of materials, such as documents or audio and video recordings, as well as forensic evidence. The questioning by a party of its own witness is commonly referred to as an examination in chief. The questioning of the same witness by the opposing party is referred to as a cross-examination. The purpose of the cross-examination, among other things, can be to bring into question the credibility of the witness or the matter about which he or she is testifying. At all international courts and tribunals, the judges may also question the witness themselves. Whether and to what extent they do so depends on the rules of procedure and evidence and also on the judge's own background. At the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, for example, we see considerable influence of both the application of Lebanese law and the participation of Lebanese judges and staff in all aspects of the court proceedings. 
So if the trial chamber is satisfied with the file submitted by the pre-trial judge, the questioning of a witness will begin with the presiding judge, followed by the rest of the trial chamber, and only then will the witness be questioned by the party that brought him or her. At the end of the trial, the parties to the proceedings usually present closing arguments. In some courts, like the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, the accused may also make a final statement on matters relevant to the trial. When both the prosecution and defence have completed their presentation of the case, the trial chamber will deliberate in private. The judges will independently and impartially examine all the material submitted and all the witness testimony to determine if the prosecutor has proved his case beyond a reasonable doubt. If so, the trial chamber will find the accused guilty. If not, the judges must find the accused not guilty. Judgment may be rendered by a majority of the judges of the trial chamber. It will be accompanied by a reasoned opinion in writing and will describe both the factual and the legal findings. Separate or dissenting opinions may be attached to the judgment. It's worth noting that the judges will only consider that which has been submitted in court as part of criminal proceedings before them and will not take into consideration any other information that has not been formally admitted as evidence, such as information in the media or from other sources. In some international courts and tribunals, like the International Criminal Court and the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, the proceedings for determining the sentence are separate from those to establish criminal responsibility. This allows the defence to focus on pleading that the accused is not guilty during trial, without having to discuss what the appropriate prison sentence would be should he be found guilty. During the course of the sentencing proceedings, the parties may submit any relevant information that may assist the trial chamber in determining an appropriate sentence. The judges can sentence a convicted person to imprisonment for a term up to and including life. There is no death penalty at any of the international courts or tribunals. In determining the sentence, the trial chamber will take into account a number of factors related to the convicted individual and the particular case. At the conclusion of the proceedings, the sentence is pronounced in open court and wherever possible in the presence of the accused as well as of the victims if they are participating in the proceedings. Those convicted will serve their sentences in a state which has agreed to accept them. In case of an acquittal, the accused will be released. However, the judges may order the continued detention of the accused if the prosecutor intends to appeal the judgment of acquittal. Such detention could last until the appeals chamber renders its judgment. Both the prosecution and the defence can lodge an appeal against the verdict. If acquitted by the appeals chamber, an accused must be released immediately unless he's facing charges in another case. As already mentioned, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon is the first international or hybrid tribunal or court which can conduct trials in absentia. It's very important to note that an accused who's failed to take part in the proceedings has a right to a retrial if they subsequently appear before the tribunal. In order for these proceedings to take place and proceed as described here, many different things take place behind the scenes. For example, in order to provide support and protection for witnesses, the registries of most international and hybrid courts and tribunals have victims and witnesses units whose task is to assist those who come to testify and provides protection when it's needed. Even though, as a rule, all proceedings are public, all international judicial institutions also have rules for the protection of the identity of a witness should the judges determine that it's necessary. The most extreme measure might be for a witness to testify in a session closed to the public, but those situations are rare. More frequently, other protective measures may apply, such as, for example, voice distortion, where the voice of a witness is heard through a filter, or facial image distortion, where the image of the witness broadcast to the public is altered so that the witness can't be recognised outside the courtroom. The judges can also authorise the use of a pseudonym. It's very important to note that all these measures are intended to prevent disclosure of the witness's identity to the public and not to conceal it from the accused. 
All international judicial institutions have another thing in common, an indispensable service which plays a crucial role, translation and interpretation. The accused are entitled at all times to follow proceedings in their own language. At the same time, due to the very nature of these institutions, it's highly likely, if not a rule, that at least some of the judges and other court participants will not speak that language. This is why all international courts and tribunals provide simultaneous interpretation in court and the translation of court documents into various languages. As we can see, criminal proceedings before international judicial institutions are just that, international. They benefit from the experiences of different national systems as well as those of international courts and tribunals themselves. And they continue evolving.